extraordinary times. At any point during this event, you can click on the link in the chat to purchase the committed on the Politics and Prose website. Additionally, you can ask the author a question by clicking on the Q&A button, which can be found near the bottom of your screen. And we'll try to get to everyone's questions. And we apologize in advance if we don't have time to address yours. Finally, we want to thank you for being here tonight with for being here with us tonight. We are so thankful to our family of loyal customers for keeping our business and our spirits afloat. It is now my pleasure to introduce tonight's speakers. Viet Tan Nguyen is an award-winning New York Times bestselling author and winner of the Pulitzer Prize for Fiction. Some honors include the Dayton Lit Literary Prize, Peace Prize, the Edgar Award for Best Fiction for Best First Novel from the Mystery Writers of America, and the Andrew Carnegie Medal for Excellence in Fiction from the American Library Association, among numerous others. He is the author of The Refugees, The Sympathizers, and most recently, The Committed, which is an electrifying story filled with violence, hidden identity, and meditations on whether the colonized can ever be free. And tonight, he will be in conversation with Tommy Orange, who is the author of the bestselling novel, They They, which also won the 2019 American Book Award. He is a member of the Cheyenne and Arapaho tribe, tribes of Oklahoma. Please welcome Vietan, Vietan Nguyen and Tommy Orange to BNB Live. Thank you, Jessica. Hey, Tommy. Hey, Viet, how are you? I'm good. How are you doing? Well, I just got my second shot of the vaccine. So if I uh, if something weird happens during our talk, I apologize. Uh, I have no such excuse, of, yeah. <laughs> what phase of the... Um, of the pandemic life are you in? We've been through so many different ones. Uh, I've, I've gotten my first dose and I hope many of our uh, uh, visitors today who are, have gotten at least one dose too, you know, um, waiting for a couple couple more weeks on the second dose. And I'm now I'm doing this very weird thing that uh, I don't know if you had a chance to do this, but the virtual book tour where I travel the world from my seat here in Pasadena, my basement. I was gonna ask you about that because um, when, when the thing hit, you know, for me, I had, I had been um, saying yes to way too much, and I'd been on the road quite a bit, and it, and I didn't realize till I stopped. You know, till I, you know, we all had to stop to some degree, but uh, for for authors traveling for their books, there was a certain amount of stopping that maybe not everybody had to do. So, what, what was that like for you? I, I was I've been wondering. I think the exact same situation, you know, my wife is happy that I'm not traveling as much because before the pandemic, I was on the road a few times a month. And now I'm still, I mean, I have tons of engagements, but I can just do it here in the basement, which means I'm free now to spend a little more time with my kids and, and just be present at home. And so that's a, that's a huge relief. Um, but, you know, honestly, it's getting a bit much. It's like, it's just like a, exactly a year yeah. into, the, into the pandemic. It's a bit much, you know, and, you know, you know, the last time we've seen, I think the last time we saw each other was in Paris. I just want to say this because it sounds awesome. And everybody in the audience is like, oh my God, really? You saw each other in Paris? I go, like, yeah, we saw each other in Paris and we had a bottle of champagne. That's what I'm looking forward to once this pandemic yeah. is over. I've had, I've kept that little line in my back pocket for trying to as organically use it as possible to be like I will I was having dinner with a uh, Pulitzer Prize winning author you know um, in Paris but but that but that meeting our meeting there was actually um, a really powerful one for me I mean it was fun and our sort of like dinner with your friend and then our after dinner talk about sort of analyzing the the time with your friend was was especially fun with my wife and our sons hanging out um, but just finding out that you were doing a sequel was really meaningful for me. Um, and it, maybe this breaks us into talking about the book um, because it's sort of when I had thought of it and I really wanted to do it, but it, it seemed like low brow and it seemed like, um, you know, a sequel is like a sellout. And there's a lot of like dirty words that I associated with sequel. And I wanted to find a way to reframe it that was like, you know, it's a continuation of the people's lives or, you know, different ways to talk about it. But then I, the more that I got to thinking about it, and after sort of feeling like I got the blessing from you, and that you were doing it too, uh, I, I started thinking about, um, you know, plot and craft and showing versus telling and all these sort of rules about writing and um, 
stuff that is changing and the people who are being published as, as the landscape is changing. Um, and I'm sure you have a lot of thoughts on this, but, but because you do this in your work, this idea of highbrow, lowbrow, like this, this idea of like having action and spy thriller and um, uh, things really happening and, and violence and scenes uh, with like long diatribes against colonialism in general, white people um, as it plays out around the world. Um, I'm just wondering what your thoughts around creating a sequel, what qualms you had, um, and, and maybe getting, just talk a little bit about this highbrow, lowbrow idea, these high register, low register, and, and, and the, the idea of sequel being associated with like superhero movies or sellout or, you know, this kind of thing. I have no problem with selling out. Okay. I'm <laughs> crass. From the very beginning, uh, I, have, I make no pretensions to being highbrow. You know, I'm a, I, I'm a refugee or come from a refugee background, and I grew up with refugee parents who hustled. They were constantly hustling. You know, I grew up watching these, my parents work 12 to 14 hour days every day of the year. And what was deeply impressed upon me was, the, one, the necessity for hard work, and number two, the necessity to get paid. All right. And I, I went to, you know, very elite schools had some very you know wealthy classmates and all of that and you know you brought up the friend we were having dinner with in in Paris this was a guy who was my high school classmate but we didn't hang out together and then all of a sudden you know I was in Paris and I discovered he was living two blocks away and he I mean this guy very nice guy but he 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 deals in financial stuff I don't even understand but he took me to like this very elite exclusive club in Paris in the, the, the mansion that was the former home of the Rothschilds. And here it's like, you know, you have to be like an oil tycoon or the people who service oil tycoons to have a membership. And so I, I, I have no problem selling out because these people, I'm not my friend necessarily, but these billionaires and all this kind of stuff, this old money, they got all the money. And like, why do we have to feel guilty about making some money here? That's number one, okay? So don't feel guilty about making money. Now that that means though that doesn't mean though that you have to compromise the art, and so that's the big challenge, right? Like, how do you still make some money but not compromise the art? And again, here I'm crass because I have no problems with sequels and trilogies and all of that, and I love uh, the so-called genre fictions, you know, like whether we're talking about spy novels or crime novels or fantasies or romances. People love stories and they love sequels and sequential stories. I'm talking about readers here, and I'm a reader, so why not give readers? what they want sometimes and that works well in the so-called genre context but we have to remember like Shakespeare did sequels right then we have to read like King Henry the fourth part one and part two or Richard the third I don't remember all the sequels that 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 Shakespeare did but this guy did sequels this he did he was doing sequels before the Marvel Comics universe was doing sequels and if we talk about people like uh Updike he did like the rabbit trilogy so there's like high literature that is in sequential form we talk about someone like louise erdrich she builds whole universes and you know and, and i don't know if she calls her books technically sequels but they're they explore the same set of characters and relationships so well, anyway and that, the bible the, the bible essentially has a sequel yes there you go <laughs> so you know our conversation was really i think more about you know should you do it and what what would that look like and i already saw some comments in the chat like yes tommy write the sequel to there there of course they should write the sequel to there, there. And, uh, you know, for me in writing the sequel to The Committed, one of the challenges was how do you do it and make it be a standalone novel? So this is for all the readers out there. You know, if you haven't read The Sympathizer, shame on you, but you don't have to have read it to have read The Committed because mm -hmm. it's been written in a way so that there's enough, you know, recall of previous events. So you can just jump right into The Committed. And so for the, for there, there, I mean, there, you know, I think those are some of the same challenges, like how much continuity to have and, and how much to, you know, whether it's going to be a standalone book or whether people should have read the first one to under, understand the second. And those are just sort of, you know, aesthetic decisions that each of us as writers has to come up with. Yeah, and I, I think I think initially, because I sold it right before the pandemic, I sold the sequel. Mm -hmm. And, um, and so I, I had no problem uh, getting the money. Um, and um, I think I was writing something very sequely and um, and I got some editorial notes and and then just 
time, a lot of the time is, is what it takes to understand what revisions need to be made. And now it's something different and, and I'm really happy with it and feel like I'm like, you know, sticking to my artistic vision or whatever. Um, but you have something in, in the committed that is very convenient for allowing it to be standalone because I feel it's a very standalone um, book. And uh, this is the, the confessions, which the first book are. Um, they sort of serve as a, this is why we're getting some information from the first book. It's a very convenient, like I'm sort of envious of how convenient that. So did you mastermind that? Like when you were writing it, did you write that in knowing that that was a way that you were going to be able to talk about the first book in the second book? Yeah, you know, like, I mean, uh, all of us who are writers, you know, when we start off, I think we have to make certain kinds of decisions that lock us down for the rest of the book. And with The Sympathizer, I knew that it was going to be a first person book. And what I, what I knew was that I wanted the first person narrator to be talking to somebody. I have this hang up that, you know, when we read a first person narrative in a book, oftentimes it's a complete fiction because we have no idea why this first person narrator is saying what he or she or they are saying, right? So in, in The Sympathizer, I wanted a reason for that first person narration to happen. And the reason eventually turned out to be a confession that he was writing. And it worked out perfectly, not just for that reason, but because I wanted this, the sympathizer to be a, a book with a Vietnamese person speaking to a, a Vietnamese person, because that meant that I would not have to explain things. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, if the implied audience is not your own community or the community of the, of the narrator, oftentimes it tempts you to explain stuff, like uh, to explain the history or the language or the culture or whatever. And I feel like that's automatically a concession to a dominant audience. That is to say, like, you know, basically white people for the most part. And so the sympathizer avoids that problem by making it Vietnamese to Vietnamese. And so in the committed, I wanted that to continue, but also, you know, again, I needed the reason, like, why are we, why do we have this book here? And so he ends up, in another situation where, again, he, he has to write a confession in the committed, so it's a different set of circumstances, but nevertheless, he ends up in that same, that same situation. Um, and you're right, I mean, it, it, it does, it's a, it's a nice little narrative device if you can find a way to make it happen in your novel. I mean, I, I wouldn't say that a reader coming to the committed, having not read The Sympathizer, is going to be thinking, um, oh, this is a convenient device. It's just me very much thinking about, like, these problems of writing a, a book, you know, a book that's conti a continuum, but a standalone at the same time. It, I just had that thought. So, so you do something very different in the committed um, in, in terms of the first one being this confessional style. Um, and I won't ruin the ending about what the second book ends up being, but um, this one feels more voicey because you do things with POV that are very interesting. There's a sort of chorus of ghosts that is in it. And uh, can you talk a little bit about your decision to do some of the structural things you did with voice and POV in, in the committed? I think it's, it's very compelling and, uh, and very new to read, which was really exciting. Well, I wanted the book maybe to do something a little bit different than The Sympathizer. We've already had the confession. We're going to have another confession. And, you know, part of the, the narrative is that our narrator has been pretty deeply damaged by the end of the sympathizer. And then we, we have him now in the committed and he's gonna undergo more damage before he writes the second confession that is the novel. And so if we're, if we're seeing the world through his eyes and he's the one writing this confession, maybe he's not completely in his right mind. And I wanted to try to convey that, that if you're not completely in your right mind, you know, your way of narrating a story may not be like the more conventional way of narrating a story. And there was no plan in advance. Like I didn't plan that there would be very some some shifts in you know in the perspective of the narration, for example, or that there would be shifts in the typography every now and then. I just let myself be carried by the flow of, of writing. And I think this is kind of important. I mean, for me, part of the writing process is rational. I map out certain parts of the of the book in advance. But part of the writing process is intuitive. I don't know how it is for you, but I just have to give in to what I feel at a certain moment, take a risk, take a chance and uh, also be playful. So I have a seven-year-old son. I've learned a lot from having children. And one of the things I've learned is that children don't respect rules. 
And, you know, as you go older, get, grow, go, or get older, you learn to respect the rules, or many of us do, and you become these rule-bound adults. And the, and the corollary in literature is that you become these rule-bound, you, be, you can become a really rule-bound writer. Like, you, you know that there are certain kinds of conventions that you should follow. Watching kids, or my son, uh, is like, you know, he, he's learning rules, but he also doesn't care sometimes. He'll do whatever he wants. I watch him play. It's very liberating because I, you know, I was like, oh my God, he really loves stories. Like he's watching Scooby-Doo and he's totally into it, you know, totally into it. And when he's playing, he goes outside in the front yard, he's playing his fantasy games and everything. He's totally into it. And then he's reading Dogman, you know, and various kinds of kids lit literature. And the, the children's authors, they don't care about rules because they know their audience. <laughs> so they're mm -hmm. tapping into this total playfulness. And I felt I wanted to capture some of that in, in the committed, which means that I think, yes, I think I break certain conventions and I also just make whimsical decisions about, you know, here I, here I will use the chopsticks font just because I think it's funny when we talk about, you know, Orientalism and people, you know, white people are saying Orientalist things to put it in the chopsticks font just to make yes. sure we understand. Yeah, so that kind of stuff. Ours is, ours is papyrus. The, the native font is <laughs> called papyrus. <laughs> Uh, speaking of breaking rules, um, so there's this writing rule and people get very sort of, they, they adhere to these certain writing rules that I, when you first hear them, you think there's no way you can break them because this is obviously, you know, authority figures speaking on what good writing is. And there's, there's not much flexibility in the way that people teach this sort of show don't tell. It's one of the golden rules of writing. And I feel like uh, what you do so beautifully and playfully, and this is something that is full of voice, um, the way that that the narrator delves into history and, and, and the, the history of colonization and people's relationships and countries and, you know, getting into the French culture. I, I don't think I really realized the extent to which uh, France as a country is a colonizer and the places that they've colonized, you know, we think of, I think of America as the capital C colonizer being a native person from here. Um, and then, you know, it took sort of going to some places uh, outside of the country to be like, oh yeah, this is something that happens all over the world to all sorts of different people. Um, but back to what I was saying, you, you have made a, a decision that's a voice decision, but it's also an idea, a novel of ideas decision that, uh, it, to have these sort of like at length telling parts. And I think it works beautifully. And I, and I think sometimes I pick up a random book and I read a random bio on the back and it says this or that MFA that I've heard of and have come to respect or whatever. And I read the work and it's really boring because it's so predictable and it so follows all the rules perfectly and it kills the writing and it kills voice. And I feel like something that you do so wonderfully in, in all of your work, but in the committed, um, is this balance of things happening, um, these amazing plot and spy thriller things happening, uh, this like sort of heist stuff, drug dealers, gangsters, these seven dwarves. But then you have these long, uh, expansive moments of, of just talking about history and, and, like I said, colonization. So can you just talk a little bit about your decision there uh, and, and, your think and maybe the, the voices in your head, the old voices saying, show, don't tell. I'm, I'm sure... They're old voices at this point, but you know, you know the voice as well, I'm sure. Yeah, well, that's a great comment and question. Uh, let's start off with the colonization issue, you know, because I think uh, when we grow up within a country and, you know, we absorb the, the dominant ideology of the country, the mythology that the country tells itself, um, it's maybe hard for us to be aware that colonization has or is taking place, you know, because it's simply a part of what, what what this country is, you know, so the United States, I like to say, a lot of Americans think, you know, we, we're not a colonizing power. That's what the French did or the English did, you know, we're, we're a democracy. Uh, and I like to say, oh yeah, we are a colonizing country, except we call colonization the American dream. You know, so we mask the history and the contemporary issue of colonization for, for native peoples through this, you know, rhetoric of the American dream and the immigrant and you can be whatever you want to be. And, and you know, the immigrant or the refugee like me comes in and, and uh, we, in my case, fleeing from a colonizing situation. Uh, and then we become as settlers, the, the alibi for the colonization that's taking place here in the United States, you know? So you, know, you can point to the refugee or the immigrant and say, hey, you know, we're a great country. And then you forget. 
or the, the refugee and the immigrant can forget what's happening. So then in France, I think it's the same thing. A lot of the French, the French are, if you read the New York Times, the New York Times is like doing a lot of articles on the French and their struggles with race and gender and colonization. And, and, the, and you know, the French are like, some of the French are blaming Americans for introducing the consciousness of these ideas into France and wrecking their, their, their universalist harmony. And I'm like, you know, that's a good thing because they've totally normalized, many of them, the history of their own colonization. And in the case of Indochina, that it is Vietnam, Laos, and Cambodia, a lot of French people have no idea what happened. I mean, they sort of vaguely know that this happened, but they don't know the details of it. And that's partly what the committee is designed to do is to, to make sure, you know, like in the sympathizer, I think the French got off easy, but in the committed, I wanna make sure I offend the French by telling them what I think of as the truth of what they did in Indochina. Now, uh, when I decided to write these novels, The Sympathizer and The Committed as confessions, it was designed to do exactly what you've brought up, which is to allow me to tell rather than just show. Uh, because I think you're right that, uh, you know, the, I think the dominant sort of aesthetic for contemporary American literary fiction and a lot of genre fiction is that is realism. That is just show things and don't intrude as the author to tell us what to think. And it works in a lot of, a lot of cases, it works really well in genre fiction because you know, it, it works with, with move, making the plot move really quickly. But when it comes to the world of the MFA, I'm in, I'm in agreement with you. Uh, you know, I think we have a literary industry in this country. And if you wanna become a, a writer, the path is very clear from undergraduate creative writing to graduate school and creative writing to the New York publishing industry. And you can be trained to be a very competent writer if you follow that track and you know what the rules are because what you're basically doing is producing a commodity that pretends that it's not a commodity, but instead it pretends that it's literary fiction, even though we all know what it's supposed to do. Uh, and so, Telling rather and showing rather than telling is really crucial to this commodity because what you're not doing is is interrogating the the system of power and ideology in which the literary industry is implicated. All right, so I wanted to find an aesthetic reason uh, by which I could tell rather than show, and that's what a confession does. So even though you're reading novels in the, in the sympathizer and the committed, you participate in the fiction that it's actually nonfiction that you're reading because there are confessions. And in a confession, you, can, you, you don't have to adhere to show, don't tell. You're actually, the whole point of the confession is to tell. And so our narrator is telling about himself, telling on himself, but he's also telling us exactly what he thinks about the United States, about France, about colonization, about racism, about all these kinds of issues, about which he is a very opinionated person, just like me. And, but hopefully his opinions are interesting and hopefully his, 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 his opinions are funny and biting. And it's also really crucial that he punches up against power, but he, he himself is being punched, unfortunately, as the butt of so many of history's jokes. <clears throat> yeah, and I think, you know, having him be half French and half Vietnamese and not belonging uh, allows a lot of that, his positioning to never really, he never, he's always punching up essentially because he, he, he doesn't find himself belonging to anything. Um, I wondered if you have a little bit something to read. I've, I've been, I just listened to the audio book. I just finished listening to it. Um, I had read the, the advanced reader copy, obviously, and then uh, found out that the same voiceover actor from The Sympathizer, who I thought was fantastic, was, did this one, and it was done beautifully. Um, okay. I, just, I just finished being a judge for an audio book award, and, and I wondered if, I wanted to ask you if, he, if this guy had gotten any, any kind of um, award or, or nods for his performance I thought not for this one obviously but for sympathizer yeah unjustly um, no did he get did he... yeah as far as I know yeah I think he's so, yeah, he's fantastic yeah. uh the actor is Francois Chow and he's actually got a really interesting background because he's he he is also uh, of Vietnamese descent and I think he was born in Cambodia um he's older than I am a little bit older and and then uh, he was born in Cambodia but then you know he migrated pretty much immediately I think or soon after birth to the United States and grew up as an Asian American uh, and so he's a, he's, a, he's an Asian American actor. And I've, I actually saw him in like plays and movies before he agreed to oh, do wow. the book. Uh, now the thing about Francois is that he has a deep gravelly 
very masculine voice, unlike me. So uh, yes, I will read a little bit, but just just rest assured that yes, you can go and listen to the audible version of uh, of the committed, and um, he. <laughs> He'll sound much sexier than I do. So this is from the the beginning of the book. Uh, there, there's a prologue, and you know the sympathizer ends in 1981 with the sympathizer having fled Vietnam on a refugee boat. That's where we end the story, and the committed opens up exactly at that same moment uh, as these refugees from Vietnam are on the open sea. And here we go. We, the unwanted, wanted so much. We wanted food, water, and parasols, although umbrellas would be fine. We wanted clean clothes, baths, and toilets, even of the squatting kind, since squatting on land was safer and less embarrassing than clinging to the bulwark of a rolling boat with one's posterior hanging over the edge. We wanted rain, clouds, and dolphins. We wanted it to be cooler during the hot day and warmer during the freezing night. We wanted an estimated time of arrival. We wanted not to be dead on arrival. We wanted to be rescued from being barbecued by the unrelenting sun. We wanted television, movies, music, anything with which to pass the time. We wanted love, peace, and justice, except for our enemies, whom we wanted to burn in hell, preferably for eternity. We wanted independence and freedom, except for the communists, who should all be sent to re-education, preferably for life. We wanted benevolent leaders who represented the people, by which we meant us and not them, whoever they were. We wanted to live in a society of equality. Although, if we had to settle for owning more than our neighbor, that would be fine. We wanted a revolution that would overturn the revolution we had just lived through. In sum, we wanted to want for nothing. What we most certainly did not want was a storm, and yet that was what we got on the seventh day. The faithful once more cried out, God, help us. The non-faithful cried out, God, you bastard. Faithful or unfaithful, there was no way to avoid the storm dominating the horizon and surging closer and closer. Whipped into a frenzy, the wind gained momentum. And as the waves grew, our arc gained speed and altitude. Lightning illuminated the dark furrows of the storm clouds and thunder overwhelmed our collective groan. A torrent of rain exploded on us. And as the waves propelled our vessel ever higher, the faithful prayed and the unfaithful cursed, but both wept. Then our ark reached its peak, and for an eternal moment, perched on the snow-capped crest of a watery precipice, looking down on that deep, wine-colored valley awaiting us, we were certain of two things. The first was that we were absolutely going to die. And the second was that we would almost certainly live. Yes, we were sure of it. We will live. And then we plunged, howling, into the abyss. So he ends up in Paris of uh, 1982. I'm just going to read you a very short bit here, because once he gets to Paris, he, uh, as I mentioned, uh, has been deeply traumatized by the events of the sympathizer, and he's going to make some very bad decisions. And one of those decisions is that he's going to become a drug dealer. And here he's going to tell us a little bit about that decision. Was I actually becoming that most horrid of criminals? No, not a drug dealer, which was a matter of bad taste. I mean, was I becoming a capitalist which was a matter of bad morals, especially as the capitalist, unlike the drug dealer, would never recognize his bad morality or at least admit to it. A drug dealer was just a petty criminal who targeted individuals. And while he may or may not be ashamed of it, he usually recognized the illegality of his trade. But a capitalist was a legalized criminal 
who targeted thousands, if not millions, and felt no shame for his plunder. So hopefully that gives you a little sense of you know, what the novel is about and <laughs> its style. Yeah, that prologue is fantastic, as is the epilogue, which obviously you cannot read, uh, but the, ep this, the epilogue is fantastic. Um, can you talk a little bit about, um, well, first of all, let me just, because at some point I'm going to be asking questions that people are asking in the Q&A, and if people just throw those into the, the Q&A, I'll, I'll just like sort of mix them into the conversation between now and the end. Um, could you talk about the decision to do the, the to have drug dealing and drug taking be an element? It's, it seemed really natural um, in the reading of it. And I sort of am doing that in, in my book, my next book as well. It's a, it's a big component. Um, so could you talk about the, the introduction of that idea of, of him, him be, becoming that, becoming a, a drug dealer and be, being involved with gangsters, et cetera? Yeah, I mean, like, um, I like crime stories. Uh, I think they're very entertaining. And in crime fiction, this so-called genre of crime fiction, one of the reasons why I like it and, and, and the reason, one of the reasons why I like um, spy stories is besides the fact that they're entertaining and they're plot driven and they keep, our, they keep the pages turning for those of us who are fans of these genres. One of the reasons why they're interesting is that spy writers and crime writers are oftentimes quite political and historical. I mean, they set their stories in historical circumstances and often in evoke, you know, certain kinds of politics like wars and, and things like that. And I think that the good crime writers or the really interesting crime writers understand that individual crimes are nothing compared to social crimes. That individual crimes are, are interesting partly because they're just manifestations of the crimes that society commits as a whole. You know, so if a, if a crime writer doesn't have that kind of awareness, then you just get an action story. But if a crime writer has that awareness, you get the action story, plus you get the commentary about the society, right? So in, in the case of, of drug wars, I, I, I'm a big fan of Don Winslow. Go read his Border Trilogy. It's sort of like the war and peace of, of drug, of drug <laughs> stories, you know, but it's all about the cross-border uh, drug war, so-called drug war between the United States and Mexico. But Don Winslow is very smart. You know, so he leads us all through all the mechanics of, you know, drug running and all that kind of stuff. But he, he's very clear in pointing out that these drug wars are actually political wars that are that originate in the United States, that originate from American consumers and American political uh, actions. And he, in the end, he compares the drug wars uh, between the U.S. and Mexico as simply another manifestation of the perpetual warfare state of the United States. And I think that's, to me, that's, that's, that's the right reading, right? And so that was, that's what I wanted to do in the committed. Number one, to entertain the reader, entertain myself, telling a story about crime, drugs, uh, violence, gangsterism, all that is taking place in the committed as the uh, Vietnamese or ethnic Chinese Vietnamese gang that he, that our sympathizer gets involved with, gets involved in a drug war, turf war with a rival Algerian gang. But of course, that's part of the political commentary. Like why are the ethnic Chinese and the Algerians fighting over drug turf? Uh, they, they're, they both come from colonized countries. Uh, shouldn't they be allies together as you know, brothers under French colonization? And of course, that's not how reality works out. You know, the people who have been racialized and colonized oftentimes are pitted against each other and take their angers and their frustrations out against each other rather than punching up towards the colonial power. So that that was, I think, you know, that was that was a major reason for including the the crime stuff in there and, and just, just to have fun, you know, just to have fun. And uh, you know, basically drugs are always fun, I think. That's my personal <laughs> experience. I, I love that lens, uh, that perspective on crime and writing about crime and being sure to have that. I just came across it myself in the process of, of writing my next book, the, the idea of, of uh, who is committing the crime and why and, and sort of contrasted with who is obeying the laws and why. Mm -hmm. And this idea of like, 
what is the the sacred law that people think is in place and who is it serving and who are the people that are committing the crimes it's the disenfranchised and it's often people who have been have had systemic wrong wrongs done to them and so why would you obey this like capital l law if if you know that you know something is happening that's not right with you uh that's not being attended to by any laws or any any conversation around policy or whatever uh but i appreciated that something else that that repeats uh, from sympathizer and the committed, um, and that I think is a really interesting um, meta layer uh, that I, I've played with in my work too, and, and continues in my next book is this idea of the cultural show. So in the first one, he's a consultant on the on the film set. It's not a cultural show, but you know, it, it, there's elements of representing a culture, and he's sort of critiquing, you know, this this Vietnam movie in in the sympathizer, and now in the committed. Uh, they sort of bond in him, become a part of this cultural show. And then the Fantasia plays kind of a big part of it. Can you talk about the introduction of the cultural show and the layering that you're doing around like authentic, you know, Vietnamese culture versus and the gaze of, of the outside world, seeing the, the presentation of culture and, and all the ways that you're working that into the, into the book. Yeah, I, I guess I can see some resonance here with like Native American culture and, and the kinds of ways by which Native American culture becomes commodified and and just turn into an exhibit, you know, or repetitive exhibit. So um, there are two, two kinds of culture shows are happening in the committed. <clears throat> One is Fantasia, uh, which you mentioned. And so part of the part of what happens is that uh, our narrator is in Paris and uh, 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 a character from the past appears from the sympathizer. I'm not, I'm not giving much away, but you know, he had a lover in the sympathizer, uh, Lana, who became a singer. And now Lana becomes a part of this traveling uh, coach, a traveling entertainment show called Fantasia. And it's based on a real thing, Paris by night. So the Vietnamese, you know, in, in the diaspora who fled as refugees, you know, so honestly, we, we are fun loving people. We like to sing, dance, smoke, drink, have fun. And we like nightclubs, all right? So one of the first things that we did was to create our own song and dance review, song and dance review. And it was called Paris by Night. It's in about 140 episodes by now, first in videotape, now in DVD, high production values. And so in this book, they, that Fantasia comes to Paris to shoot a live episode in Lana comes along. Uh, so there's an opportunity for a lot of singing and dancing and pop music and all that kind of stuff and cognac drinking that Vietnamese people love to do. Now, the other culture show uh, is something that I became very familiar with <laughs> because uh, in the United States, on college campuses, wherever there is a Vietnamese student association, the students are compelled, feel compelled to put on an annual culture show. And they're not alone, like the Korean students have one, the Filipino students, the Japanese students and so on. So there are all these culture shows happening. And in the Vietnamese case, if you if you go to a Vietnamese American student culture show, and I went to a bunch in college, they're all the same, and they all involve things like you know let's recreate uh, peasant life and the the romantic courtship rituals of peasants. Let's sing the, the no, let's do the fan dance. Let's 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 stage a scene in the in the rice fields and everything like that. Let's wear our traditional ao yai, the traditional garb for men and women. And after three or four of these shows, I was I was kind of sick and tired of them. And uh, you know, in the book, what I point, they, 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 the, 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 the sympathizer and his best friend Bon volunteer to be a part of the culture show in Paris, and it's an opportunity for opportunity for me to satirize the culture show. And part of the point I'm making is, why do we feel obligated to put on this this uh, this calcified version of our culture and put it on exhibit? Is wearing an aoyai part of Vietnamese culture? Is is being in a rice field part of Vietnamese culture, especially when the people who are putting on this show, most of them have never stepped foot into a rice field, a rice paddy, you know? And isn't Vietnamese culture as much like, is, is wife beating Vietnamese culture? Cause I know a lot, I mean, there's a lot of wife beating that takes place in Vietnamese culture. Is alcoholism a part of Vietnamese culture? Is gambling a part of Vietnamese culture? I grew up with all this stuff happening around me in the Vietnamese refugee community. Is welfare fraud a part of Vietnamese culture? I think it is. You know, and but why do we not celebrate that? But instead we celebrate, you know, the fan dance. And then I think about how like Americans don't have to put on culture shows. You know, there's no such thing, uh, there's no American culture show like, that American students feel obligated to put on. Uh, and that's because everything is American culture. If you live in the United States, everything is American culture from burgers <clears throat> to B-52 bombers. 
Uh, and the same thing with France. You know, the French don't need to put on a culture show because they already export uh, their version of French culture. That's why we all think about the Eiffel Tower and baguettes and mimes and accordion music when we think about Paris. That's the French culture show. So even for us, you know, the so-called uh, you know minorities to put on a culture show is, is you know we do it to affirm ourselves and to preserve our culture, and that's kind of I guess it's important, but it's also kind of a sign of weakness. And why do we need to preserve our culture and you know just keep it in a bottle somewhere? Um, this is, it's a very double-edged kind of phenomenon, and so that's part of, part of what's being satirized in uh, in the committee. Yeah, and I, I think you know writing books where you're where you're getting into your own culture. I, and I think you obviously do it in a very knowing way and you lean into the this ability to be able to deconstruct all of it. So you're not at risk of putting on the show, but but even being in the industry of, of the literary world and in publication, you're always, I feel always wary of like, well, I'm not trying to like do this for the white gaze or like, I'm not trying to present my culture. And, and I'm sure you get lots of questions um, that try to you know ask you to sort of delve into the showiness of it or to show off your life where like people of color and, and women for the most part when they get asked questions it's like well what part of this is your life uh, and you're not really asked as much about craft and your imagination you're like well what parts of all of these characters are your life and um but which brings me to asking you a question about your life no i'm just kidding uh which brings me to ask asking you a question about research uh, i'm wondering because the, the breadth of knowledge and and uh the expanse of the vision of the character is incredible and and i know that you have a history in you know in academia and uh i know that you are very well read and knowledgeable about a lot but I, i'm wondering how much research influences your work and what does that look like i know you lived in france and you, you may or may not have a place there um and, and was that part of your research or did you just want to be there? Well, you know, I, I uh, like, I'm mentally colonized, okay? I mean, honestly, I'm mentally colonized. Like my parents were born literally in French colonization. Um, my 86 year old father, you know, still remembers the French songs he had to learn when he was a kid and he still sings them nostalgically, right? And even though intellectually I, I, I'm anti-colonial and I think that, you know, I'm trying to figure out how to, how to do decolonizing work in various, you know, aspects of my life from the scholarship to the writing to activism. I'm mentally colonized because I get weak in the knees when I hear French, okay? <laughs> like, I like a baguette as much as anybody else, right? So I wanted to write the committed to both to express that, to express the, this ambivalence about, about knowing that we've been colonized and resisting being colonized all at the same time. And I think it's totally possible to be politically anti-colonial and yet still to be to be sort of be, be culturally colonized at the same time. And I knew that, you know, from an early age, uh, because I'd been to France many times long before we met each other there. And my wife and I, you know, we spent seven months in Paris as our on our honeymoon. We were really lucky we could afford to do that. And in fact, this little clue, you know, a little Easter egg in, in the novel, the only address cited in the novel is where we spent seven months. In uh, in Paris, and so that was part of the reads. That was you know sort of you know I, I knew something about France. I knew something about Paris and the geography and, and all that kind of thing. And and I knew something about what the French had done to Indochina by reading history books long before this novel. So, but when I decided to set off to write this novel, um, I, I I knew that I had to you know make it at least semi realistic. So. That was the excuse to go to Paris for a couple of summers, including the summer that I, that I saw you there for a couple of months each summer. And thankfully, you know, the novel set in 1982 to 1984, but thankfully the geography of Paris hasn't changed. The, the fashion has changed, you know, um, the people have changed a little bit. And so to set myself into that time period of 1982 to 1984, I watched a lot of French movies from that time period, uh, listened to French music from that era, from the 60s, from the 50s up until the 80s. Um, looked at a lot of photographs uh, and, you know, discovered a photograph from 1984 that was so incredible that I had to put it into the book. It's the only photograph that appears. And it's a photograph about the first time that people of color in Paris, and the French wouldn't agree to this term, people of color, but 
the, the immigrants or their descendants from, from uh, North Africa and West Africa, the Algerians and the Moroccans and the Senegalese and so on, staged a huge march for immigrant rights and against racism. And there was a Vietnamese contingent there. And that's what the photo is. Uh, and in the photo, it's the, the, the French of Vietnamese descent. And in the front rank, there are some young men wearing masks. And that was perfect because in fact, there are masks happening in the committed. So that kind of research was really you know, fortuitous. And then to research French colonialism, uh, looked at all of these photographs of what the French were doing in their colonies in Asia and Africa. And a lot of it was around sex. So, you know, it was really kind of shocking to, to see some of these images, uh, both the fantasies of the French towards their darker uh, subjects, uh, but then also some of the horrible things that were being recorded as well. And all of that led leads to here. Here, here here's a selling point for the not for the novel. I hope the big orgy scene that happens at the end of the book. You know, and then yeah. So I mean, the, the research was actually kind of fun, you know, because um, you know I'm learning. You know, so I, I, you know, after my two summers in 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 Paris, I was like, oh god, I'm such an American. I still can't speak French. It's so embarrassing. So now I'm I'm enrolled in French classes again. You know, I, my son is in a French school. I have to I have to learn French, or otherwise this kid is going to grow up speaking better French than me and able to keep secrets from me. And I cannot allow that to happen. Um, maybe we could segue to one of the questions. I want to start trying to ask some of the audience questions. Um, speaking of your son, um, you're, you are referred to more often than not um, as Allison's dad. <laughs> not exactly you because, you know, because of that time we spent together. Um, how 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 is how are your kids doing? You you have a new one, I think, that came right before the pandemic, right? Yeah, yeah. Simone, named after Nina Simone and Simone de Beauvoir and many other famous Simones, uh, was born like I think like three or four months before the pandemic hit. So she's a baby who's known nothing except the inside of this house <laughs> and the and the local park. And uh, but she seems to be totally. I mean, like you know, I mean, she doesn't know anything else. I mean, she seems happy, well adjusted. Ellison, thankfully, is like his father. He's an introvert, so he doesn't mind being home for school. In fact, he doesn't want to go back to the physical school anymore. He, you know, he likes, you know, it's been, it's been the biggest project uh, of the confinement um, for him, for us as, as his parents has been to try to persuade him to not just wear pajamas all day long. So we consider it an accomplishment that now he actually puts on some shorts and a t-shirt and he'll comb his hair. And that's huge. That's a bigger issue for us with him than the social isolation um but you know it's it's really cool i don't know what, what your experience with 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 felix is like but uh it's really cool like watching them grow you know and uh and 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 you know i'm teaching them stuff i hope but like i said with the whole thing about reading children's literature i'm learning stuff you know the whole dr seuss thing came up right and unfortunately that's i think pretty accurate because it's like when i was growing up i had curious george and tintin oh both of which i love but they're they're problematic all right and he's growing up in sort of this anti-racist moment of children's literature with writers of color, but also with writers who are conscious of what they're doing culturally and racially. And there's some amazing stuff that's being produced. And I'm, I'm learning all kinds of new children's literature through, through him. Mm -hmm. And uh, mm -hmm. that's a lot of fun. Well, I hope speaking of uh, your, your book uh, with him and um, uh, I, I hope you got a little bit of a book tour with him before the pandemic. Wasn't, didn't it come out in 2019? Yeah, you know, this is a kid, you know, by that time he was six, he was going on book tour. You know, I, I, I flew with him to Seattle and we went to um, uh, Elliott Bay. That's the, that's the bookstore in, in Seattle, right? Or that port? No, that's Elliott Bay. And I was like, we had, we had an event. And I, and I said to him, do you know how many writers would kill to have an event? at Elliott Bay Bookstore and you're six years old and you get to do this. So we did a couple of those kinds of events. You know, we were going to be on the main stage at the LA Times Book Festival. And the last time I went to the main stage at the LA Times Book Festival, it was Billy Idol. You know, and then the confinement hit and we, so we had to do it virtually. So he's had a kind of a, a charmed existence and he's taken it for granted. And I have to say that it's a good teaching tool because uh, he did get an advance for the book. And on, on our chalkboard, I have the advance written. I deducted his agent fees because I'm not paying his agent fees for him. Okay. So he had to pay his agent fees. 
And then, you know, every time he buys Legos or, you know, buys an Apple TV subscription to Scooby-Doo, we deduct. And he's almost out of money. So I'm hoping he gets the message and we'll write a sequel because I'm not paying for him. I'm not paying for him. <laughs> he, better, he better write. <laughs> okay, let me try to get to some of these questions. Um, people are posting in... in Let's see. We are in a literary renaissance with authors like yourselves, Adam Johnson, Yagi Asi, and many others. Um, thank you for mainstreaming the counter narrative. We had an attempted white supremacist insurrection. How does this end? What do you, uh, maybe we can expand this a little bit to um, our current moment. Um, you know, we we had we had we had the end of Trump, and we have uh, what seems to be you know. A, a peaceful presidency so far. In my opinion, there's still problems and probably you feel the same that they're trying to stop Deb Holland from getting the Secretary of the Interior position, which would be really historic. Um, but what do you think about the moment in, in publishing, um, especially regarding COVID hitting the industry and what we had before that um, was definitely writers of color becoming more mainstream and and, and probably more manuscripts being acquired. Um, what do you think about this happening and the way COVID hit the industry? Do you think we'll see more diversity be becoming normalized or do you think there'll be some backlash because they wanna make sure and get their money uh, where they need to? Well, you know, to, to address the first part of the question about how does this end after the, um, you know, the Capitol riot or insurrection or whatever you wanna call it, you know, I don't think it ends, it's like, I, I, I think, you know, American history is, is cyclical um, because we're built on a contradiction, this country, you know, like we have all these high flown ideals that we all know about. And then the country itself is, is, is built on slavery and genocide and colonization and occupation and all that kind of stuff. And, and the, the, the profits of that are embedded in the inequities of our, of our current system. And so, are, and so are all the feelings and ideas that justify these things. And so that's why we could have Obama as one president and then we flip it over and then we have Trump as the next president. There's, there's just two, two aspects of this, of this contradiction. So the, the, the Capitol riot, obviously quite shocking, up, upset me, but I don't think we've seen the end of it because we haven't seen the end of this contradiction that is America. So, you know, I mean, literally America unmasked itself at this Capitol riot, literally unmasked itself. And, you know, all those people who were going around being shocked, clutching their pearls and saying, this is not us, this is not America. This is America. This has always been America. Always been America. We've just forgotten about it, you know? Like we've been lynching people throughout our history. We've been suppressing votes throughout our history. This is America. And the sooner we understand that, the better of a chance we might have to do something about it. So when it comes to the literary industry, you know, we've, we've uh, I guess had our moment too of uh, racial reckoning, you know, uh, with this awareness that the inequities of American society are present in a very liberal industry like the book publishing industry. And I think people in the book industry generally hew to liberal values of inclusion and diversity and all that kind of thing. Uh, but nevertheless, the editorial staff of the publishing industry, according to one report at least, is about 85% white. So you can totally have these liberal values and yet have these inequities built into the actual practice of an industry. So it's not up to us, that is the writers, you and me, to do anything about it. We can draw attention to it, but it has to be the publishing industry itself that makes these decisions. Now the publishing industry, you know, uh, because of its values, talks a good game about needing multicultural writers and foregrounding multicultural programs and giving writers like you and me prizes, <laughs> which I'm not gonna turn down. But, you know, that's not the same as systematically addressing socioeconomic inequities that are manifested in the hiring practices and the promotion practices of the, of the industry and who gets to hold power. So I think the publishing industry still has to demonstrate that it's taken that reckoning to heart um, over the next few years. So we just have to wait and see. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it's uh, not something that I've I've heard really voiced about. You know, the the inherent biases of editors who acquire manuscripts and this sort of subjectiveness of 
what makes a good manuscript. I mean, the, the fact that there's so many books about sort of middle-class white people that take place in New York is, is you know, that's the, the uh, direct outcome of them not knowing their inherent biases. Like, this is a good book, is this, but it's like so related to the editor who read it because you're from New York and you're white middle-class and it's, it's speaking to you so strongly because, you know, that that to, I don't know what that what, what it's going to take for that kind of reckoning or if it's even possible, but uh, it seems to be happening across other industries too. And and uh, still, you know, we, they just dropped the uh, the TV film rights for there there. Unfortunately, I was really hoping for an all native cast. Um, I was wondering uh, about that, 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 I want to hear about this. What do you mean? Who's they? And what does it mean they dropped the rights? Uh, we, we had sold the rights, a, a big production company had it. For, I don't know why I wouldn't mention them because they dropped it. HBO had it for two years and uh, then they it didn't They didn't end up wanting it in the end. And so they, the rights reverted back to me. Um, They're always going to screw us, the writers. You know, we, <laughs> that's why I'm, I'm never like optimistic about TV deals and all that, all that kind of thing. Because we're up Speaking of machinery. So, so with the sympathizer, I'm sure... Um, it's it's been optioned, but is it is there steps into production yet? Uh, well, it's been double option. So it was optioned first by by my producer, who paid me a small sum of money, and then it has been op- it has been optioned by 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 a studio who's paid me a, a considerably larger sum of money. So, um, but there's money in the bank, so I guess I can walk away with some money in the bank, you know. But I would still like to see it get made, and I'll just tell you a little bit of a story, and maybe it'll resonate with with your experience, you know. But when I was first trying to get this thing. Uh, made, you know, I I, uh, uh, I was talking to this Asian American producer, uh, and we were totally on the same page artistically and politically. And, and if you know, if if I've mentioned the, the things that she's done, you'll know exactly what they are. They're they she does she's done really great things. Um, and so she went off and she tried to sell it, and she came back and she said um, after several months, it's about in 2016, and she said, um, you know. Uh, and you have to remember the sympathizer is half his part French and part Vietnamese. So he's mixed race. She said, you know, if we, if we want to sell this to Hollywood, we have to get somebody like they're telling me, we have to get somebody like Keanu Reeves to star in the sympathizer. And this was about the same time that Narcos was out and Narcos is about the same budget as we projected like 40 or $50 million for a series for, for a season. And there's nobody famous in Narcos. So why, why can you do that for narcos but for the asians you got to have keanu reeves i think it's kind of racist so eventually we did i did manage to get a producer to option it and he's canadian which i thought makes total sense because americans are going to screw me in hollywood because americans have so many hang-ups about the vietnam war they can't see straight and then we found a director and the director is perfect you know, um, again, if I said his name, then you would know, but I think they're waiting to, to do, sort of do, to mention, to do some kind of publicity for this. But this director is one of his movies was nuts and is a total influence on the sympathizer. Uh, so this is perfect. And so now, um, you know, hopefully because money has been committed and the director has been signed and, you know, uh, yesterday or two days ago, an A-list actor who you would all know, you know, his agent reached out and said, he's interested in uh, the white male parts in the book. And the director's ge- you know, genius insight was that he was going to cast one white male actor to play all the white male roles in the book, like you know Peter Sellers in Dr. Strangelove. And I thought that's, that's brilliant. But I think my, my hopes are really, really low. Yeah. Well, I mean, though, I think there is probably a lot of parallels between the, the, the pool of, of, uh, Vietnamese actors and actresses that are sellable or marketable or knowable so that you can sell it to people that'll fund the film. Same with native actors, you know, it, you know, the, the killers of the flower moon is coming out from Scorsese and you have DiCaprio playing, but it's like the white savior sort of, it's still being told is that's the hero p- position and it's not really a native perspective. Mm-hmm. Um, but well, I hope, I hope, for for the sympathizer and and then the committed I, you you may have sold both rights to ones because i think sometimes when you sell rights for one it carries over it to the characters for the sequel automatically i think they have the which option brings me to the next one. yeah go ahead which brings me to i believe you told me at some point that this is all part of a trilogy 
Um, could you speak on that a little bit if we can look forward to another one? Yeah, I've taken a lot of notes while I was writing the, uh, the Committed towards this third book. And it's definitely the end, you know, definitely the end. And um, I know that he comes back to the United States. And I know that he comes back in the mid to late 80s to make amends and to seek revenge. And it's going to be, I hope, crazy. You know, I mean, I, 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 I know this is the time period when you have Star Wars, the space weapons program, and you have the Contras, and you have the rise, and it's gonna be set in Southern California. So you have the rise of Little Korea, the, the rise of Little Saigon, you have the flooding of South Central Los Angeles with, with crack, you know, which arguably uh, was a CIA pacification campaign against the African-American population, all that stuff is I hope going to be jammed somehow into this final installment of the Sympathizer trilogy. And indigenous colonization, you know, the colonizations of, of, of indigenous people, I'm, I'm thinking about how to incorporate that as well um, into the story of this novel. Great. Um, can we possibly look forward to, because I feel the, the voice is so singular and strong, it, it, the novel voice for you. Um, and so different than the, what the refugees is doing, just in terms of voice. And I love both for very different reasons. Can we? Are you still at work at short stories? Can we expect another collection? No, never. Because <laughs> <laughs> that one took like a really long time to write. Is that right? Was that one was? It was a really traumatic experience to write the refugees. That short story collection, like that was like twenty years of my life for a book that most people can read in like a day. <laughs> and I'm just frightened you know, I'm frightened. Like, I don't want to go back into that hellhole of writing short stories. I'm afraid that I'm not any good, you know, like with novels, I, I feel like I can explain everything I'm doing with short stories. It's so intuitive. And I'm afraid of going back into that completely intuitive space where I don't know why I'm doing what I'm doing. And I'm afraid of just getting sucked into a hole. Um, so no, well, it's, it's, it's one of my favorite short story collections of all time. So I hope you, I hope you uh, can fight your way through that fear of the whole. Um, okay, let me try to get some more questions. Um, going back to highbrow, lowbrow, what would you both recommend to writers who feel like they have to increasingly compromise their art in order to break into the industry, i.e. write what the market wants you to write, especially in the cultural hegemony we live in with COVID slash social media seems to have only strengthened, i.e. has made risk taking so much more risky and commodities increasingly one thing. Long question, thank you. I admire you both. No, I don't know. When I read there, there, I didn't feel like you were selling out or that you were trying to cater to a market. Um, I thought there, there uh, was a lot of fun to read. Number one, um, and and that's a that's a good thing in my opinion, and that it was doing something innovative and new, uh, and yet it was still kind of formally interesting as well. You know, it wasn't like some kind of you know feel good cookie cutter kind of story. So I think it's, you know, from my perspective, it seems like it's totally possible to, to try to sell books and yet also, you know, adhere to some kind of unique individual vision. Um, I will say for myself that, you know, for the sympathizer, the breakthrough for me was actually to stop thinking about selling books or really to stop thinking about, will, will an editor or an agent or a publisher like this book? Because that's what I thought when I was writing The Refugees, and it was really kind of crippling. And uh, The Sympathizer, the, the crucial moment was, excuse my French, uh, was for me to say, fuck it, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to write this book for me. And lo and behold, it turned out that there was an audience for that. And so I, I have some kind of idealistic conviction that, you know, we, when we write books that are very unique, that we are also creating our own audience. Now the publishing industry doesn't see it that way because the publishing industry, just like every other industry wants a sure bet. So they wanna know what the audience already is, but that's a self-defeating you know, situation for those of us who come from communities that are being ignored by the publishing industry or Hollywood or whatever. So with the committed, likewise, my, my mindset was, well, I would love for it to sell books, you know, um, but really I'm writing it for myself, um, which would allow me to do whatever it is that I wanted to do. And, but part of what I wanted to do was to incorporate genre fiction and to make it entertaining because that's what I like. 
you know? So did you feel that way when you're writing there, there, were you like worried about an audience or was that just not a matter of concern for you? It, it wasn't. I mean, I, when I first started writing, uh, I, I wasn't even thinking, I was just wanting to get to the end of a book and finish something that I, you know, was, was happy with when it, by the time I got to an MFA program, I was about halfway through writing it. So the vision was already there just for, for me to want to finish a book, but you can't help if you're in an MFA program, you, you are interfacing with the idea of publication and you're meeting with teachers who are published and that's part of how they can teach in an MFA program. But I, even at that point, the goal leaving the program was to get a teaching job by somehow magically publishing a book somewhere. Um, and so even then it was an audience. It was like, I want a teaching job because uh, I need to work because I was very broke at that time. Um, so the, the audience thing, it, you know, it, I can't help but speak to it now. And like you said, it, it created an audience. There are now fans of people who like they're there. And so I, I wouldn't say that the, those people are in the writing room with me. Um, I have my own demon, a room full of demons that keep me plenty of company uh, and try to sabotage me. Um, but luckily the, the voice of like, who's going to read this still isn't there with me. Uh, and it wasn't there while writing there, there. Do you feel like, uh, the, the writing process and the, the voices at the page changed from like before, you know, Pulitzer prize and it, the, the bigness of what you've become. Do you, have you found that it's changed at the page who is in the room with you? No, I mean, honestly, I think because I already made that psychological decision with the sympathizer um, and then the sympathizer won the Pulitzer Prize and sold a bunch of books. And so part of my mindset after that was, how much do I really need? You know, do I really need another prize? Do I need to sell more books? Uh, isn't that enough what I already got? And that's very liberating because, you know, it really, it's enough. So if, if, I already have, if I've already had enough, then I can, I can still do whatever I want in the committed. And so... Yeah, that it, it remains a book written for me. I hope people come along with it. Uh, I think if, if, you, if you're part of the audience that like the sympathizer, I'm, I, I'm betting that that's more than likely you'll like the, the, the committed too. That was always my hope, you know. But, but, but yeah, I mean, I, I, I do want to uh, always make sure that you know there's authenticity to the to the artistic experience, just because you're being true to yourself and what you believe in. Well, I think anybody who loved the sympathizer, the, the committed, uh, you pulled off this thing where you, it's a standalone and it's, it's uh, the revisiting of, of, you know, certain elements, but, but uh, it's its own thing and it's fantastic. I loved it. Um, it is very haunted. There's lots of, there's a chorus of ghosts in it. Um, and from a craft perspective is just sort of nerding out from the writing decisions. Um, I just love the decisions you made and I love to watch you do them in the book. So uh, congratulations on, on finishing it and it, for it being out in the world. I'm sorry that it uh, has to be like this. And um, I'm, I actually have the, the Japanese whiskey that you sent me uh, is still, it's still in the box because I, I, I'm currently just on a little break from drinking and uh, I will, I'll send you a picture of when I open it Mar probably April 1st because my deadline is March 31st for my next draft. And uh, I think the day after I make that deadline, uh, I'll make sure to take a picture or send a little video of a, a toast to you. Uh, well, good thank, congratulations on finishing this draft. I mean, I looked at some of the comments and people are excited about a sequel to There, There, and So Am I. And yet do the unboxing video. Kids apparently like to unbox toys. Adults can unbox liquor, you know, so go ahead and, and do that. And I'll, I will have another drink with you virtually. Thanks, Tom. Thank you. Thank you both for being here tonight and for everyone who joined us virtually. Um, you can support um, these amazing authors and PMP by using the link in the chat to purchase the committed, which is amazing. If you haven't read it, read it tonight, tomorrow, ever and ever. Um, and they're there as well. And the sequel, which I will be anxiously waiting along with everyone else. Um, and be sure to check out our website for the most current updated event listings. Um, we hope to see you all there and thank you for joining us tonight. Stay well read everyone and we will see you next time. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Thank, thank, you, thank you. Thank you, Jessica. Thanks, Jessica.